verse 7. I want to read one simple scripture. It said, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. Leave that up if you don't mind for just a minute. Blessed is the man. Boy, I like the way that starts out because I need a blessing. I don't know what your week's been like. I know what my week's been like. And I could just, I could stand a blessing about right now on Wednesday night, heading into a long weekend. Blessed is the man who trusteth in the Lord. You know, we trust a lot of things. We, 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 we've been trusting a lot of things for a lot of years. We really have. We trust that when we retire, that Social Security money will still be on deposit and we'll still get a little check. We trust that. Those that are approaching retirement age hope that every the third of every month that your Social Security check will still be in the mail. Those of you that 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 uh, that, uh, that that you know trust that support, hope that it's there because you you exist on that support possibly, or you utilize utilize that to to subsidize your lifestyle. We trust a lot of things that we cannot see already. We trust the fact that that. Uh, that there's no harmful UV in the atmosphere. We trust the fact that, that the air that we feel blowing through the air conditioning ducts is, is really just a good old air and not carbon monoxide. It all feels kind of the same coming through the vent. Until you go to sleep, you don't wake up anymore. We trust a lot of things we can't see already. So why do we find it so hard to trust in God? I've used this analogy before. We breathe in and breathe out without any thought. Trusting the air that we breathe that it's still here. But in the absence of all air or all oxygen in this room, things would appear the same. Except we would all be dead. Just be a lot of dead bodies on the floor. So we trust things we can't see. Do you think about every time you breathe? <sighs> Okay, in just a second, I'm going to do that again. Okay, in just a second, I'm going to do that again. And what is it about going to the doctor that you're breathing fine? Everything's good. And then he comes over there and he puts that ice cold stethoscope on you, on your front or on your back or wherever he puts it. And he says, breathe normally. <laughs> and we just panic. I do, Brian, I don't know. I, I just, I thought I was breathing normally. Am I abnormal? Am I not breathing right? It, am I weird? Did, 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 am I too, is it too deep? Too shallow? Not enough? <laughs> I was breathing yesterday and he said, I just breathe normal. I said, I am breathing normal. He said, don't try it again. I said, well, then describe what normal is because I'm just trying to breathe normal. He said, you seem really uptight. I said, I am uptight. I said, I'm at the doctor. He said, well, I kind of hear a heart murmur. And I said, great, now I really feel bad. He said, I want you to go see a cardiologist. Then, okay, great, now my heart just... I, you know, I'm breathing all over the place. Just be, you know, I don't think about how many times I breathe. And I, don't, I don't have the stats on how many times a person, average person, a person that's not as bad as I am, breathes in a day. But I will tell you this. I do know this, that an average person breathes probably several thousands of times a day. But I don't think about it. I just do it. You know, I don't think, I don't wake up every morning saying, okay, I'm going to live for God. I don't walk over and look in the mirror and say, okay, you can do it. You can make it. Try hard. You're going to make it live for God. Don't sin. Don't be a devil. <laughs> don't cuss. Don't drink. Don't do bad things. Don't choke somebody. I just get up. And live. Get up and breathe. Get up and just trust that 
His grace is sufficient. That His love and His mercy and what He has poured into my life is enough. I don't reason every morning on where my hope is today. My hope is always in the Lord. Because you know what? I put my hope in other things that fail me. I put my hope and my trust in other things that didn't work out. I just know this. There's one guarantee in life. That if I put my hope and my trust in the Lord, I'm blessed. You know what? I found out that hope is the very thing that can anchor us. And allow us to have secure moorings in the harbor of life when the winds of trouble come and, and, and problems uh, are like a tempest that surround us. It's hope that is our anchor in the times of trouble. But when you lose your hope, you can be blown around everywhere. Without hope, circumstances will, will blow you at its wheel. Life itself, I think, hangs on the value of hope. And that's what I just wanted to talk about for a few minutes tonight. I'm not going to keep you much longer. Really not. The value of hope. Hope. Now, I want to say, first of all, Brother Bradley, some people confuse hope and faith with the same thing, but they're nothing like, they're nothing alike, really. Hope is the first thing we must have before we can even move toward faith. For faith is the substance of things what hoped for. So you got to hope first. But if, if, you know, if, if you lose your hope, it's hard to have any faith. You know, they say that people that are terminal, that, that, that go in the hospital and they're terminal, if they lose hope, they don't last very long. But if they maintain their hope, they may even recover and get well. But when you lose all hope, it seems like you've reached the bottom. I know this. That if I can hope in something, that's the baby step toward faith that I need to receive something from God. Hope is just something that we should be able to do without even thinking about it. You don't have to worry or think or fret yourself about hoping. Hope should be an instilled thing within each of us. It should be an elemental aspect of our, our hearts and our lives. You know, that we hope things get better. That we hope our children turn out right. We hope that we get that job. We hope that it doesn't rain. We hope this and we hope that. But the, to take hope to the next level is faith. Because you know what? You can, you, you, you can hope and not do anything. But you can't have faith and do nothing. Because faith without works is dead. Now you can hope all you want to. And never turn a tap. Never do a thing. You can just hope against hope. And hope is something that should re remain even when our faith is gone. I preached a message years ago that, that was entitled, when, when faith is abandoned, hope remains. People that had lived a life and done all they had, and in, finally their faith was gone. But as long as they didn't lose hope. For faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. The material aspect. Faith brings things into the material realm. We get active in our faith. We start speaking faith, walking in faith, talking in faith, proclaiming in faith. We write a card by faith. We make a call by faith. We tell our testimony by faith. We encourage somebody by faith. We bring somebody to church by faith. We minister by faith. Those are things we do after we have hoped. After we've hoped. Somebody say amen, please. It's lonely up here. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. I'll read that to you just a minute. That at the time you were without Christ being aliens. Everybody say, I'm an alien. Scripture says it. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope. And without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off, does that describe you without the Lord? Were made nigh, are brought close, are brought in by the, by the blood of Christ. Aliens from the commonwealth of God because we had no hope. We were lost without God because we had no hope. But when we just started 
the simplest aspect. We kicked the snowball of hope off the hill. It grew larger and larger and larger to where once our hope was built to a certain point, then we started acting and reacting by faith. First Peter chapter 2 verse 9 says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. You should show forth the praises of him that hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It's because of that call we can have hope. You know what? I don't dwell in the darkness anymore. I don't dwell in the darkness of sin. I don't dwell in the darkness of ignorance. I don't dwell in the darkness of, of misunderstanding. You know why? Because Jesus Christ is the light of the world. He shined his light down in my heart, in my life, and exposed those areas that, that, that uh, made me hopeless. And now I can hope, and I can have faith, and I can, be, I can walk in faith, and I can talk in faith, and I can see results in the kingdom by faith because of my hope in God. Hope has great value. We don't ever want to lose our hope. It's the very smallest element of moving forward in our lives is having hope. You said it, and I said it, and I said it a moment ago. I hope the weather's good today. I hope when they get there, they still have those chill you know, so like. How many times do we say we hope we don't even pick, pick it up? I hope I get that same lady at Pro Cuts that cuts my hair. Huh? I hope my prescription's ready at Walmart after church. I hope my car starts when I go get in it after church. Amen. I hope my blood pressure's not too high. I hope if it is that I have the money to buy my medication. I hope I get my paycheck tomorrow. Do you realize how many times we utilize the concept of hope and don't even realize it? What if we live with the absence of, of hope? It'd be terrible. What would we look forward to? How would we have any optimism about any aspect that we, that to approach life? We would just say, I know they're not going to have this when I get there. I know my car's not going to start. I know it's going to rain. I know it's going to be bad. I know I don't have the money. I know that, I know that my battery's dead. I know that this is not going to happen. That's what life is like without hope. You know what we should be as far as a people and as far as a church? We should be a place that when people come in, they can feel hope. They can feel hope. They can, they can look at the lives of other people. They can, they can hear the ministry go forth. They can, they can be a part of the worship experience in our church. And they can have hope that things in their lives are going to get better. That their family can come to God. That their children can be saved. That their life can be enhanced. That they can be healed and they can come to God. And they can, they can know the Lord. And the same experience you and I have because we have hope. Now, I know it's not a really exciting thing I'm talking about, but I'm no, talking about just a, I'm talking about first grade in God. This is first grade stuff in God. You can't afford to abandon your hope. Can't afford to lose hope. Can't afford to give up hope. Amen? I'm fixing to finish up. You can't base your hope in this world only. For Paul said it best. He said, for if I had hope in this world only, I would be of all men most miserable. Woo, boy, I'm so glad that I'm just passing through. And I'm so glad that this, that my eternal reward is not wrapped up in things on the earth. I'm so glad that, that this is not as good as it gets, but it does get better. I'm so glad to know that, that you know, if I'm sick and I go through life sick, one day I'm going to meet the Lord and I'm going to be well. I'm so glad to know that, that the loved ones that I have lost over time, I'm going to see them once again, and I'm going to be reunited with them on the other side. I'm so thankful that I have that blessed hope for of the glorious appearing of the Lord Jesus one day. I'm not going to abandon my hope. I'm not going to lose hope, and I'm not going to let anything or anybody steal or rob me of my hope. It's mine. It's God-given. It's a part of me, and I'm going to hold on to it, and I'm going to This world's filled with a lot of counterfeits. There are fake Rolex watches. There are fake diamonds. There's fake gold. I was in Europe, couple, you know, two or three weeks ago. The latest scam. 
that they do in the European countries is that uh, so touch and not, believe it or not, we would hold hands. In Europe, we don't hold hands in America. <laughs> we did over there. Nobody knows us. We were holding hands. Our two little kids, we were walking around. Getting us so much fun. Mmm, boy. Smell that. Oh, let's go over to that cafe. Let's have a little something to eat or something. We were holding hands. And someone would join you and come walk along with you or beside you or maybe right behind you. And, and you notice that suddenly you're being kind of being shadowed by somebody. And they would, they would bend over and make a fuss. They would say, oh, look. Whether it be right in front of you or right behind you or right beside you, they would say, oh, excuse me, uh, did you drop this? And you would turn around and it would be a man or a woman, doesn't matter who it is, and they would have a very nice, uh, what looked like gold wedding band. And they would, they would hold that up and say, did you drop this? Is this yours? <laughs> and the first time this happened a couple of years ago, I picked it up and I said, I don't think any of us dropped anything like this. And I looked at the, the band, had a nice weight. <laughs> Very beautiful polish on the inside. It was stamped with the European equivalent for gold in 18 karat gold. I looked at the markings inside and I said, somebody will be very uh, sad that they lost this wedding ring. I said, no, this is not ours. And the person said, well, you can, you can have it or you can keep it. Is there no reward for finding it? I mean, is there no reward for me being a good Samaritan? and picking this up and offering it to you? Is there no reward in that? Many tourists would say, hmm, uh, 650 $700 heavy gold ring. Yes, that's worth 20 euros to me. And they give the person 20 euros and they just sold you a five cent brass ring for $20. And they do that all day. <laughs> because we watch them. We, we, you know, I just hand it back. No, no, thank you. We're not interested. Oh, is there no reward for, for being noble? No reward for being good? And we walked over and kind of hid ourselves behind the building. And when somebody would buy the ring or pay them for being noble, she would go over behind the tree and she had a box and she would open the box and get another ring. And she would wait on somebody to come by and she would go over and drop it right by them and say the same thing all day long, making thousands of dollars a day. Fake. It's all fake. There are fake paintings, fake politicians, and fake preachers. The world is full of counterfeits. But there is no counterfeit for the Spirit of God, for the real deal. And when people come in to an atmosphere of hope, and they experience an atmosphere of faith, and they see hearts and lives that are truly moved on and truly touched. And it's not fake. It's real. It's authentic. They can walk away with an experience saying, surely the presence of the Lord is in that place and operates among those people. Yeah. Satan offers hope. And I'm really raised to conclude. Satan offers hope. You would hard to imagine that the devil would offer you any hope at all. It's hard to believe, isn't it? He offers you the hope that you won't get killed or kill somebody by driving home drunk. I said he offers that hope. He offers the hope that you won't get AIDS from a promiscuous sexual escapade. It's a faint hope, but nevertheless, it's like rolling the dice. It's a, he offers you hope that you won't get fired from your job if you have a DWI. He offers you hope that you won't get caught living an alternate lifestyle or living a life of crime. He offers a lot of hope, but it's the wrong kind. Somebody say hey, amen. amen. In this world, the world longs to replace or rob you of the righteous hope and the good things that God has and replace it with something that has no future at all. No future at all. 
You know, bad news sells. Yes, speak to us. You hear that? Zoning in on us. Aliens, I said something about it. Here they are. Bad news sells. Got on my computer this afternoon. I, I went to AOL and I just want to see what the top news stories were of the day. Here you go. Ready? This is this afternoon, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Benghazi report could become 2016. Big bombshell for Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Everybody said, Praise the Lord. Okay. And <clears throat> number two, imminent terror attack against church discovered. Number three, what to expect from this year's deadly hurricane season? Number four, Obama caught in yet another controversy in the Senate. Number five, two Girl Scouts horrified by cookies' contents. The top news stories this afternoon at 3.20 on AOL. Now, where's the good news? Where's something that keeps our hopes alive? Where's something that, you know, if you can't even trust a box of Girl, a, a Girl Scout cookies, what can you trust? Where, if you can't hope that when you get your box of thin mints, they're going to be cool, then what's up with this world? Is life worth living? If the Girl Scouts cookies are messed with, even Girl Scouts cookies are at the top of the news. We know there's all kinds of fakes and, and counterfeits and issues with politicians and with preachers and with churches and, and issues with, with people who look one way and do another. But you know what? Uh, our hope is not in the news. Our hope should be in the gospel, in the good news of, of Jesus Christ. My hope is in the Lord. My hope is in the gospel. You know what? I know the gospel works. Can somebody say amen to that? I'm a recipient of the promises of God, and I know that this gospel works. I will tell you this, that we find that the good news is truly that. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. He didn't say, I've come so that you could lose all hope. I've come so you can see straight through and know that I'm not real or authentic. Jesus, after he was crucified, was seen and known of men for 40 days, but right after his crucifixion, he appeared behind closed doors under the disciples and one man who's, who was, who's been touted with a moniker his entire life, doubting Thomas, he walked over to Thomas. And Thomas had just said, he said, I will not believe unless I can push, put my hands in the nail prints, my fingers in the nail prints in his hand, unless I can touch his side. Jesus appears behind closed doors and walks right over to Thomas. He said, Thomas, put your hand in my hand. Reach hither into my side. Touch my side. And a man who had lost all, all hope that the Savior was crucified, dead and gone, Jesus proved who he was. Proved that he was the risen Savior. And what was Thomas's response? The only disciple who ever acknowledged in, and when Jesus was alive that he was God robed in the flesh, he fell at the feet of Jesus and said, my Lord and my God. He had the revelation of who Jesus was when he touched him. You and I have the revelation of who Jesus is when we touch him. A little story I want to share with you and I'll finish up. A man whose youth an early manhood had been spent in evil ways and who was converted to God was one night giving his testimony. He had met an old drinking pal during the week who chased him for turning pious. He said, I'll tell you what. I said to him, you know what I am? He's, he was a lamplighter. When I go around turning out the lights, I look back and all the road over which I have been walking is all darkness. And that is what my past is like. I look in front and there's a long row of twinkling lights to guide me. And that's what my future is since I came to the Lord Jesus. Yes, says my friend, 
But by and by you get to the last lamp and you turn it out. Where are you then? He said, then, says I, well, when the last lamp goes out, it's dawn. And there ain't no need for any lamps when the morning comes. Our past, you can't, there's no hope in the past. And you know what? We can't change what happened 10 minutes ago, 10 seconds ago. We can't relive that moment. All we have is the future to look forward to and to hope that things. I said, hope that things. Hope that things, hope that things get better in the future. Hope that our lives can be changed in the future. Hope that we can be renewed in the future. Hope that family members will come to God in the future. Hope that we will, that we will continue to live a life that's pleasing unto God in the future. That's where our hope is. And remember, hope is the baby step toward faith. And if you already have hope, thank God you haven't lost your hope. So then you just take and build on the building block of your hope and now start having some faith. And then put your faith in action. The Bible said if we'd have faith as a grain of mustard seed, mountains would be removed. Think about that. It's a very small thing. So if we enact our faith through our hope, we can do great things. Would you stand with me tonight? It's not a fancy lesson tonight. It's nothing that uh, you would go home and say, wow, I've never heard that before. It's nothing you would... Turn to your neighbor and say, that is the most prolific thought I've ever heard. Although I wish you would. <laughs> Nevertheless, it's the building block for solid relationship in God. I talked to Brother Brandon Knight in my office before church started. I said, it's uncanny, Brother Brandon. I said, when troubles come, people always run in the wrong direction. My hope, somebody here tonight, can, can you say, my hope is in the Lord. My hope is in the Lord. My trust is in the Lord. My faith is in the Lord. My faith is in this message. My faith is in the Word of God. My faith is in the move of God. My faith is in this church that is going to be here whenever I come back next week. And it's still going to be preaching the truth and we're still going to be living a life that pleases. Somebody's faith needs to be renewed in your home. 